All right, Mark Curry. Glad to have you on Cam Capone News. Man, glad to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's what's up, man. You've mm -hmm. been going crazy lately. Man, you know, it's 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 been spreading, but I'm I'm happy. Everything's people been taking good to what I got to say. So yes, yes, yes. Glad to be here. Glad to be thought about. Glad to be known for it. Yep. Man. Man, that's what's up, man. So you wrote a book a uh, little bit, a little bit more than ten years ago. More uh, about about fifteen. Fifteen years ago, about your experience as a bad boy, man. Yep, yep. It's fifteen years ago. I wrote that book, "Dancing with the Devil: How Puff Burned the Bad Boys of Hip Hop." It's a memoir of my life, just dealing, doing business with bad boy. Um. You know, I, I had to write that book in order to have some kind of closure to like what, what didn't happen with the music career. But, you know, it's there. I wrote it that long ago, man. It's just now becoming a, a topic to people. A wanted to know topic, wanted to talk about type of thing. What was going on that made you want to write a book after all, spending all that time with Puffy? Well, what it was was once I realized that the music career wasn't going, it wasn't, it didn't seem to be taking off. So I was like, okay, um, I'm a writer, and there's so many different ways for me to 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 write a song or write a book. So I said, instead of wasting the time and spending time writing music, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a little time to write a book. And right around that time, I started writing the book. The same time during my lateral years of being signed as an artist. Uh, um, I started doing the book then, yeah, and I just had to do it because I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna attach something to Puff, so no matter what, when, whenever he's in the news or whatever may happen to him, uh, when, whenever people might notice him doing something great, I want them to be able to think of me and, and also purchase that book. So it was just my way of saying, you know what, I might have to attach something to him to make sure that I win from this from um, this business deal, other than not having anything to show for it. Okay, now, uh, around what time or what year did you guys actually meet and officially, you know, did you join Bad Boy? See, I knew him, I knew of him and knew him um, back in like 1995, back when they say Bad Boy 1995, ridiculous, back in those years, you know, the words of the great big. It was around uh, 1995, 94, 96. Those were the years. That's when Bad Boy, you know, um, he, did, he didn't really get the money to, the money that he had to sponsor Bad Boy until like 1995, up in those years, when he, when he signed with Arista. So when he was coming to Atlanta, because we had a club here in Atlanta and a rim shop here in Atlanta, so all of the, the celebrities would come to Atlanta and the first place that they would come visit was either the club or the rim shop, you know. So I knew him from a lot of them, not him, but he, you know, just the, the, the social circle of those that he keeps around him. I knew a lot of those people and he just happened to be a part of that circle, you know. So I've been knowing him before I signed to do music. I've been knowing him, I, I signed in, um, probably like 1996, 97. But I've been knowing him from doing the, uh, coming to Atlanta and all of those kind of things before I signed. Okay, and now, you know, what was Puff like back then? Did you see any of the stuff that you've seen later on in him at, at the beginning? Or, you know, did he change at some point or? Arrogance, always been arrogant, always still the same arrogant person. Um, you would think that he would change over time, but time didn't really change much with him. He was still the selfish person. You still thought him as, as being the, the selfish boss or the, the label owner who wants to be an entertainer as well. So it's like competition all the time. Very competitive, um, competitive with his artists. Um, just, I believe he's competitive with himself, but that's just another story, you know. Okay, well, you know, what do you think was like one of the first, you know, situations that kind of let you know, like, oh, okay, Puff isn't 
quite this, you know, friend friendly guy that I may I might have thought he was. You know how when you say you know a, enough of trying to be friends, you know if we're gonna be dealing with each other on business, let's just deal with, with business and let's not confuse the friendship in the business, which was confusing, you know. But I I knew that when the when the business wasn't going as good. And, and the friendship was still there. I was like, hey, man, so maybe we got to put the friendship aside and focus more on the business because it's easy for you to just get, you know, uh, lost in the having fun, going to parties and doing those kind of things. And you'll forget about the business that like what Puff would do. You can go in there and be like, yo, Puff, I'm here to talk to you today about business. And then we'll talk for a second. But for some reason, he has a way that when you leave out that room, He'll have you going out thinking that you just have one more thing you need to do before you're able to have everything that you're working hard for. So it was always that one song that he was telling me that I needed in order to have this career that I was looking for. And that one song was just something I was just trying to, I was working so hard trying to get that one song and I realized one day that one song don't exist. And I was like, what he's trying to tell me to do it, it's just, it's, it doesn't exist. It's not a such thing as a one song. It's just a way for you to send me out of this office, not answering my question and having me going out to work hard again. You know, one thing about being an artist, they always, they always try to keep the artist hungry, you know, keep the artist broke, keep the artist starving. And they feel that that's the best way to get the best out of you. So, you know, so it's a, I guess it's a, I guess you can say in so many words, it takes for you sometimes to have to suffer to, you know, to, to, to make you that star, to polish you up, to be that diamond that you may be. You know, diamonds, sometimes you got to take a diamond out the rough and polish it up. So like with an artist, they feel like you're like a diamond in the rough. We got to take them out the dirt, clean them up and, you know, put them to the world. So, you know, it's the life of being an artist that makes sense. At one point, you do actually sign with him. Mm -hmm. And what was that day like, and and how did it go for you? Man, I thought that was the best business decision, the best business decision I ever made. And I, I just knew when I did that, when I signed with him, that everything was going to be okay because I seen him. His success rate was real high, you know. And I felt like everyone who was um, a part of his camp was happy, and I thought that all of them were having their moments of success too. So I thought it was just a, a great business move, which turned out to be something that it wasn't the best business move, but to still be here, you know, to, um, to you know, I don't have to be an artist and a music artist in order to be an artist. So I just had to take my artist, my, my talents and my abilities and apply them into other things other than music, you know, if that makes sense. But, um, I wanted to, man, it could have, it felt like I just wanted to, to just hip hip hooray, just jump for joy. And I was just happy at the moment. And I, you know, calling home, telling everybody, everybody in my home was, was proud of me for what I was doing. Everybody was happy. They just, they just knew I was on my way up out of here. And um, that never really happened. You know, we did the song, We Ain't Going Nowhere. It seemed like I never, my career never really went nowhere. I just, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have been on that song. Cause when I said we ain't going nowhere, bro, I ain't go nowhere. Right after that song, no matter how hot it was, I thought that my career was going to take off from there. You know, career just didn't. He just did not put the funds into, he did not put what it took, put into me what it, what it took in order to, to put me out there in the public as an artist or to promote and market me those marketing promotion dollars wasn't behind me. Now you were around before Biggie passed away, right? Yep, 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 right around, right around 95, 94, right? Well, he died in 97, right? Yes. Yep, 97, yep. on March 9th, 1997. Um, yeah, I was there before the demise of, of, of Biggie um, and, um, yeah, I used to, you know, in the clubs, when we used to go see Puff in the clubs in L.A. when he would come. Um, I think um, when they out, were out there for the Grammys, because I was, I was an artist and they thought that I came from Los Angeles. 
So whenever Puff would come to Los Angeles, that's when I would have to go to the studio to, to kind of wrap songs up most because we didn't have um, email. We couldn't email songs. We had to FedEx them. So when he came into town, I would go into the studio just to make sure that when he leaves and go back to New York, he has all the CDs and everything that he needs with my music on them. So um, like when they came out there for the awards, I was there. I hung out with them briefly for a couple of parties we went to. But then after that, I went back to the studio. And when I went to the studio, that's when I got the news that, you know, Biggie Smalls had got shot out there in Los Angeles. But I was out there the whole time. I was already there. I'd been, I'm, I was on Hollywood in Cahuenga. The studio was over there. That's where I used to work at her. Okay, now I seen you talk about in your book that you believe uh, Biggie wanted to leave. Yeah, Biggie, you know, every, of course, every person, once you are in that position where you, you know, you figuring out the best in you and, and your, your self worth, and when you feel, you know, that you're worth more than what you're receiving, then, you know, the first thing that comes to you is reaching for another structure, another deal. So that's not something that I find strange or something that just happened with Biggie. It happens with a lot of artists once they see their value and then they say, hey, you know what? I'm worth more money without this middleman. I'm worth more. I can go directly to a major label and I can have a deal instead of having a, a middleman deal in, in place. Like if uh, it's like being signed, like Biggie was signed to Bad Boy and then Bad Boy was signed to Arista. But Biggie would have probably had a better chance at doing good business had he had been signed directly to Arista, if that makes sense. The people who may not understand that one. Um, Bad Boy still has a parent label, whether it be Interscope, Arista. They were never a record label. They, it was just an imprint under a label. What was it that made you think Biggie wanted to leave? Did he tell you that directly? No, nah, he didn't tell me that directly. But as an artist, I can understand why, because you, you, you're you on a label with an artist who's also the boss and you, you're not getting the attention that you need. It's like the same way Puff wants to file for discrimination for the liquor companies not um, putting his liquor brands out there and promoting them like they're promoting other the other brands that was on the label. It's the same the same case because he didn't promote me as an artist or he might not be promoting Biggie as an artist as hard or as, as much as he's promoting himself. So you say, okay, I'm not getting the fair treatment that I deserve on this label. And in order for me to get that treatment I'm looking for, the only thing I'm gonna be able to do is get off of this label. So a lot of artists, I mean, the locks wanted to be off of the label. Um, Black Rob wanted to be off of the label. Everybody who was on the label wanted to be off the label. In fact, everybody who seemed to have been signed to any label, or any, they always wanted to get off of the label, especially when they felt like the, the label wasn't treating them fairly. Now, was, do you know that, was Biggie getting shortchanged with his money? Like, did he not get a good advance or, or anything like that? I mean, when you think of advances and things like that, somebody's going to give you an advance towards what they feel you're worth. And it's hard to give someone an advance if you don't know their worth yet. So that advance is kind of like not even worth taking sometimes because you say, hey, if you know that I'm capable of going out and making um, $100 million, why is my advance only $50,000? If you believe in me the way that you feel that we're going to make numbers, we're going to make 100 million. Maybe give me 10 million. Maybe give me 15. So the advance that you get is not, it's like being popular, being famous, and being seen on television a million times. And you only have maybe $1,000 in your pocket to show for it. You know, um, that, that kind of is like a, a, it's not balanced. It's not worth it. You know, um, you said that Biggie had to sell dope and, Homemade duplicates of his CDs just to earn some money. Man, that's what when, when every everything in the music industry, where well, every person at that time who wanted to be into the music industry usually came from the streets. So it's almost like um, every drug dealer at one point in time wanted to be a rapper, and and they always wanted to have a record label. So yes, being able to sell tapes and CDs, I, I've done it. 
with being able to sell tapes and CDs out of the trunk of your car is just like selling drugs because you would think that your CDs dope. You would, you know, so, <laughs> so it's just the same way that we used to, it's the street movement. Either we gonna sell, you gonna sell drugs or you gonna sell music. And it was just a choice, you know, when, it, when we were coming up, it was like the only two choices that you had. Either you gonna try to be a musician or do music or you gonna sell drugs. It's either or. So, you know, it was, it was a lot of artists other than Biggie that came into the industry as drug dealers first and then artists second. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it sucks. I mean, I still had to do things that I didn't want to do, um, not all legal, that, and even I was still signed, and I just had to do it to survive. So surviving is different when it comes to being an artist, is you have to survive. So if you're not surviving and you're an artist, that just makes life bad. So in, to, for him to have to be as famous or as successful as he was and still had to do those kind of things in life kind of shows that the music industry really doesn't take care of the artists as much as people would think. Recently, Puffy had a lot of serious allegations come out about him. You know, uh, the biggest one was Cassie. Uh, you know, she wanted $30 million from him. That's what she was suing for. And the next day, Diddy settled. And then, you know, after that, several women came out accusing him of rape and, you know, a, a whole list of different things, man. Y you know, what do you think when you first seen these allegations come out about him? I thought that <clears throat> when a man falls, the first thing that comes tumbling down is his empire and his enterprise, which is his business relationships between different companies. So when I saw his enterprises, I saw, I, saw the, I saw his enterprise fall because a lot of the people were severing ties with him and they didn't no longer wanted to carry business relationships with him. So seeing that, that was the fall. Um, just seeing that happen and um, it's just the fall of man. Um, every, every, every man has his, his chance and his time to be on top but every now and then, a lot of a lot of us fall off the top. They we fall from the top. We fall from grace. We fall from being loved by people around us that love. We fall from being liked by the public. Um, that's the worst feeling in the world is when the public turns their back on you and they start seeing you for um, who you might actually be. So when I saw all of this coming down on him, I knew that this was an enterprise falling. Like it's, uh, it was big, cause it's gonna hurt him. It, it hurt him in a lot of ways other than just in music. It hurt him in the school that he was being a part of. They didn't want to be a part of him with. Um, it hurt him where they didn't want him to come to the Grammys. They, they didn't want to invite him. But then I think they turned around and gave him a Grammy too, right? They, they're giving him a Grammy this year, 2024. They're giving him a Grammy. But when we look at the Grammys and we're looking at the real world and we're saying, okay, the Grammys is 1,200 people that are in a group, uh, part of their members. And of these 1,200 people, they're the ones who determine who deserves what award. Of 12, and most of these people of the 1,200 are uh, the majority of them are white males. So and nothing is racial, racial about it, but, <clears throat> and then they, not only do they do that, they do the BET Awards. So we having a lot of these award shows and people are getting awards and we don't know what they're getting awards for. So, you know, they gave them an award now, they nominate them for award, but it's just the B, just the Grammys. That's just the Grammys. It's not by people's choice, it's by, uh, uh, the, a decision made from within, like with the MTV wars, the, the executives were the ones that made the decision who deserves an award. With um, the Billboard Awards, the um, sales and the people's choice is with the, who determines who deserves the award. The Grammys is judged by 1,200 people that are in a, they're members of a group. The, the, record, the Recording Academy is what we call it. That's what they call it. 
And it's crazy because the CEO of the Recording Academy, he also has sexual harassment charges against him. So it's like all of the higher executive, all look at um, L.A. Reid. He had sexual harassment charges against him. Um, uh, Russell Simmons, he has uh, had sexual charges, harassment charges against him. Uh, Jimmy Iovine, he has sexual harassment charges against him. It was like that. that's something that was happening. It, it was part of the culture, I believe. And then finally people woke up and said, hey, this is not right. And they're finally speaking up against it. But this has been going on for a long time. Is this something that you've seen in Diddy even way back then? Like, you know, how was his interactions with women, you know, when you guys were, when you, you know, because you were with him during the prime of his career. Yeah. If, he, he wanted all the attention, all the girls, and all the money. So any man who's selfish like that, you'd be like, man, you want all the girls too? You got all the money. You just want everything? So that's when you can tell. You, can, you know, like, even if you walk into a, a room and, and he's in the room and you have a, a female that, that's extremely beautiful and he seemed like he would get mad because it's, it's not his girl. Or I would go out into the clubs, right? Club Cheetah, anything in New York. I would go out and meet me a pretty young lady or something like that. And I bring her back to the studio. And when I get back to the studio, come to find out this was a female he'd been trying to talk to ever since he was in school or high school. And then now he's looking like, how did you get her? I'd be like, I got her because she liked me, you know, and, and then I talked to her. She liked everything that I was saying, you know, and then now you could tell like, wow, I, I feel like you know, me and you gonna have a business problem just because of this female now. So it was a time when I was like, I didn't want to bring no females around him or no nothing like that because I felt like everything was jeopardizing what I had going on business wise. You know, I had to leave that out, you know. Man, did that kind of surprise you back then? Like, this is puffy, man. Like, and you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't really, it seemed like, even if even if Puffy didn't get the girl that he actually wanted, I'm sure there was still plenty of women who wanted to be around Puffy. Right. <clears throat> but the problem is when you're not a creator and you're not creative, you're not able. Your only thing you're able to judge off of what you want is by taking what other people have from them. You're not creative. You're not able to look at a female and see the beauty in her. You can only look at her and want her because she belongs to, 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 to Capone or she belongs to Curry. You know, I just got to have what's yours. That's a sick way of thinking, man. That's a, a sick individual. I don't I just want your car. I just want your chain. You know, I want your house. And that's what that's why in, in the music industry, you see it happening all the time because the same individuals is dating the same females. It's like they just recycling the same women, recycling the same jobs. It's like, wow, there's no room for improvement in this, in this industry. There's no room for an advance. There's no, how do we advance when everything is just so such a tight circle and locked? It's hard to maneuver like that. It's been a lot of that in the industry. Well, were you surprised when these recent allegations came down? Were you surprised nah, that it finally happened? I wasn't surprised because you could tell a lot about a person by the way they treat people, period. You understand? So I wasn't surprised. I just knew that, you know, everything that comes up must come down. I was waiting patiently for, not saying that I was waiting for him to fall off, waiting for the fall of him, but I was waiting on, I was either, I was actually waiting on the day that he actually woke up one and, and said that, you know what, he wanted to decide to give his life over to good. Or, you know, I want to try to do better as a human being. You know, I want to be a better friend, things like that. I want to, I know that I was, a, um, a, you know, the owner of the Bad Boy label and you was an artist. I want to call and check up on you to see if maybe you eating, to see if your family's okay, see how life is. You know, I want to check up on you as a friend. To have a call like that, or a change of heart like that would have meant a lot from somebody like him. But to be rich 
and or a billionaire and selfish. It's like, how in the world can you be a selfish billionaire when everything that you have, people helped you get? And then you turn around and then say, you know, he's a he's nothing but all of the business he did on MTV with Danity Kane, Day 26, all of the G Dep, he's all of the Black Rob, he's all Biggie, he's all Faith Evans, Carl Thomas, he's all a uh, hood fellas, uh, he's all Tammy, he's all little Jerome. So everything that he's all in one. He's that one artist. He is bad boy. You know, so when you used to think of bad boy, you would think of bad boys like the super friends. It consisted of Aquaman, uh, so many different characters. And it's not just one person. So it was a time when bad boy became all puff, all diddy, nothing else. He did the, um, the saga continues, the bad boy and the family album. The first song was bad boy for life. The second song off the album was diddy. The D, the I, the D, the D, the Y, I. So if the album is Puff Daddy and the Family, why is the second song all about you? That just shows how bad he wanted it to be about him. He didn't like the fact that people were like, hey, the, the, the guy who was on the third verse of Bad Boy for Life, he's nice. We want to hear more from him. That made him say, oh, no, we don't want to hear no more from you right now. It was competition. It's hard being in competition with your boss. Yeah, I've heard it's really difficult signing to somebody who raps if you're a rapper or an artist because they're just never going to push you like they push themselves. They're not going to ever let you. But so if, if that's the case and he knows that that's the way business has been going between him and his artists, why is he complaining about the liquor company not pushing his 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 liquor? as much as they're pushing other brands. He's done the same thing to artists. He didn't push artists the way he was pushing himself. So maybe what goes around comes around. Maybe the, it's coming back on him. You know, he, how, you can't expect to keep doing bad business and bad business and then good things keep coming to your business. Bad things come to people who do bad things. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Well, were you ever around Cassie? Yeah, I was around Cassie doing when um right after Puff it came out. I I left Bad Boy right in around 2008. I started writing the book in 2000. I released the book in 2009. So right around my lateral years of being signed, I think we went on a tour. Excuse me. We went on a tour. And uh I think right around the tour that's when I was having the, the time, the opportunity to talk to him about what's going on, what, we, what can we do about my career? All right, so look. So when I was talking to him about the career, I said, look, it don't seem like this music career thing is gonna work. I said, so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead on and, and start doing the Bad Boy South and I'm gonna start promoting Bad Boy South to the B markets. So I, I had like uh, Boys in the Hood, um, which was Jeezy and, and Big G and and uh, oh, man, I can't forgive me for not naming all of them. Then I had like Black Rob. I was promoting his album, and I was taking them to the B markers, way in, not the A markers, but like you know the Beaufort, South Carolinas, the um, Columbia, South Carolinas, the um, the uh, Roanoke, Virginias, anything south, um, Columbus, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia. So I was taking the artists down into those markets. So I went and bought five vehicles to start off Bad Boy South. And we had an agreement that he was going to let me head on Bad Boy South because I was looking for something else to do other than be an artist. Well, that didn't fall through. And I wound up being stuck with five vehicles, five car notes. I wound up having to give these vehicles away to other people who, can, who just agreed to pay the car note. So I was left stuck with the short end on that deal. And that was just something that I was trying to do to, to move on in the music industry and say, you know what, if I'm not going to have this career as an artist, at least give me the opportunity to be a part of the business. That didn't work. That didn't work. Okay. So Cassie, did you ever see anything when they were together? Like, did you like notice their relationship? 
being off or did it ever seem violent at times? You know, the only thing I really ever looked at was like, dang, I always looked at like, what if she just came to him because she wanted to be an artist and she thought that she can sing and he thought that she was beautiful and instead of entertaining uh, what her dreams were about in her eyes, he wanted to date her and made her his girlfriend. So it's like, that's a, that's a big, a big form of sleeping with the help. It's like, how in the world could somebody come to you to be an artist with all of these females there are out there in the world that he can, he can have a relationship with? Why would he want to have a relationship with his artists? Right? So then now that's a control thing. Now he's going to control his artists. You in order for you to have this video, I'm gonna, you're going to have to do this. In order for you to um, have this watch or this ring, you're going to have to do this. So I did see a lot of the females that have relationships with him from, uh, I seen him with um, Kim. I seen him with J-Lo. I remember Kim and J-Lo's relationship with him because I remember when, um, when, when he started dating K uh, 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 J-Lo, that's when we used to have land phones and stuff. And he used to call me at the house because I used to live at the house in New York, his old apartment. And then he had moved into another spot with J-Lo. But he'd call me and be like, Mark, take the phone off the hook in case Kim be calling. So I'd take the phone off the hook so the phone just be busy all night, you know. And then he was dating with J-Lo. That's when he was dating her. But as far as the relationships, I seen him go through the relationship with Kim. I seen um, his arrogance in the relationship. I seen violent times with him in his relationships, not just with Kim, where I seen him in all of his relationships, if you ask me, but then that's something that sometimes is typical in relationships. You know, I'm not saying that arguments is something that we get used to, or, 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 but it just happens. It happens in a lot of relationships, mine, yours, his. But yeah, I, I've seen those violent spurts in him, those jealous moments where, um, you know, um, he doesn't want you to give his girlfriend a hug type stuff or she, he doesn't like his girlfriend looking at you and admiring you. You know, it was it's one thing. Man, I tell you, that's funny. I want to tell you something that's funny. We was on the People magazine, right? And uh, when we used to go to Miami, I used to uh, I, I built me a motorcycle from scratch. You know what I'm saying? I built it and I was on this little motorcycle and everybody else was on scooters. And when I pulled up to his house with this motorcycle, everybody was like, yo, wow, Mark, that bike is dope. And I seen J-Lo looking at the bike. And I was like, okay, J-Lo liked this bike, right? And then Puff didn't like that. He ain't like the fact that, he don't like the fact that anybody likes something that ain't his. If it's yours, he gonna want it from me. If I got a hot song and it sound good, he gonna want to buy it from me. He wanna use it for itself. That's a, it's a crazy yeah. sign. That's that's a crazy. You know, it's, a, it's a crazy work environment. What happened that let you know that he was mad? Is there anything that happened? Um, you could see his expression with his like. You know how somebody be like telling a girl like, "Be quiet, sit down, don't say nothing, don't speak to nobody." Yo, come here, hold my hand. Go over there, do this. Sit down in the car. Matter of fact, don't even be here right now. Could somebody take her out? That kind of stuff. You know, real insecure. But you know what? I, I really couldn't blame a lot of his females or, or for, for liking other people, especially other people like me, because you can see so much more in a person like me than you possibly you probably. They could see more in me than they could see in him, because in, in him, they don't see, you know, that 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 he's in love with himself. But other people may not be in love with him as much as he's in love with himself. You know, it's a lot of females who I know he was dating that would say, you know what, I'm not just going to date him because he got money. I still want to go and hang out with you and do this. And you'd be like, well, you hanging out with me is great to mess up my music career. It's going to mess my business up. So you'd be like, yo, let's just hang out with each other where he don't see it then. What do you think was like his most jealous moment that you had with him? Jealous moment or that you've seen? The, the most jealous moment. <laughs> We used to, when we was on tour, we went to Jamaica and uh, 
he had this one girl that used to be a back, or she used to be a singer, and uh, I'm no a dancer. She used to be a part, you know, the group dancer thing. And then he had the singers too, but the girl was bad. She was a dancer. And uh, when we when we got back, we flew into um, to um, Port, uh, we flew into Jamaica, and she wanted to hang out with me and go to the mall and all of this kind of stuff. And I ain't gonna lie, I did have a little fling thing going on with her, but that was between me and her. And and nobody actually knew nothing about it because, you know, I ain't kiss and tell all the time. So um, we get back and he was like, yo, Mark, um, have you slept with her? And then I was like, I don't want to lie and say no, because then I'm, I'm not going to seem like a man. So I was like, yeah, I slept with her. And he said, how did you sleep with her? I said, I slept with her because she liked me and, 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 and all of that. So then after that, he moved the girl to a whole nother, another hotel. He made sure that she didn't hang around nobody on, on like the B part of the team. He was A team. He rode with the A bus. I was on the B bus. I rode with just the artists and the singers and some dancers. Him was, his bus is Puff, the, uh, his manager, and whatever else might be on his bus. He made sure she didn't get back on that bus no more. You know, and then he, he, he looked at me one time. He was like, Mark, you date girls like Black Rob. Like, I was like, yo, so what's wrong with the girls that back Black Rob like? And then he was looking at me like he wanted to hit me. He was like, yo, you know, um, he was like, yo, you look like you want to fight. And I was like, I do. So every time Puff used to see me, he used to say, Mark Curry, do you still want to fight? And I'd be like, yes, I do. I still want to fight. Every time he see me or he called me, when he called me um, about um, the publishing, one of the first questions he asked me is, Mark Curry, do you still want to fight? And I be and I always say, yeah, I, I still want to fight. I still want to fight. How was the J-Lo and Puffy relationship compared to any other relationship you've seen him in? Did he treat her different or do you think he treated her the same? Man, no... I don't really think J-Lo had many relationships with Puffy's friends. Like, Kim dated Alby Shaw. Um, she dated Dallas Austin. But J-Lo, I don't recall her dating too many other people before Puff because she had just came from and live in color. Right? So he really, really liked her. He really, really liked her. But Obviously, she really, really liked other people. And that relationship went sour because I don't think I, I, I saw a lot of things like Puff being controlling in that relationship. And I don't think J-Lo was really the kind of person that stood for control, like being controlled. And, you know, the kind of people, what is she, Puerto Rican or something like that? Them girls get violent, yeah. yo. When you try to uh, trap them in, mentally do them wrong like that, all that mental control stuff. Nah. So you kind of knew that wasn't going to work with J-Lo. But he, she didn't have, she wasn't a part of that circle that where the female has been passed around from one person to the next person. She was just her. He really did like her. But I sensed a whole bunch of jealousy in the relationship, true. And I do know that um, once he got into that shootout, you know, when, when they had the shootout at the club, Puff had a manager named Benny Medina. And then Benny Medina told J-Lo that it would probably be in her best interest to break up with Puff because he was going to ruin her career. And she broke up with Puff. That broke his heart. And then Benny Medina wound up no longer being Puffy's manager, and he started managing J-Lo. And then he had a, uh, at this time, Puff was doing the Sean John. And I believe he had went and took a lot of the people that worked from Sean John and had them working for J-Lo. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah, J-Lo got it. She, 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 she ran for the uh, for, for cover quick. You know, and the manager told her that would be the best thing for her to do other than sit back and let him tarnish her career as well with what he was going through. So she, she broke out. That hurt. That broke his heart. Yeah, he made songs about it, right? Yeah. I need a girl. I need. He he went to being a um. He went to crying on all his records, 
I need a girl to ride, ride, ride. I was listening to this song, man. That ain't what you really need, man. You don't need no more of them girls, man. You need you need some time to yourself so you can learn you a little bit more. You know, you can understand more about what you're doing wrong. Maybe you can straighten up and do right. But he, I need a girl. Then everything that he got seemed like it's a song about him needing a girl. And then the way the way things is looking, we don't even know if he's really, if this is true. This industry, mm -hmm. you got a lot of people, a lot of females is singing about how they need a man and they don't even like men. And then you got a lot of guys that singing like how they need a girl and they don't even like girls. So everybody's lying in their lyrics. Okay, so Puffy was accused of being with men. He was also accused of liking to watch uh, Cassie be with men. Did you see any signs of this when you were around him? I, only thing I really saw was I'm like, yo, I, I just can't have a, um, you know certain kind of men, like uh, around like uh, like. When I want something to eat, I have a certain kind of man that goes and gets my food, or if I'm going to take a flight and I need some underwear for my house, I have a certain kind of man that goes to my house and get the underwear. If I just want to get my car washed, I have a certain kind of man that goes and does it. And it was almost like the, these certain kind of men were like uh, being used as, um, they just do boys. People who always will do whatever he would ask them to do. So I seen a lot of that. Um, I seen a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of things that, that you would question, a lot of questionable people, um, people with reputations that are known for, um, and I, I don't like to discriminate on no one's sexual preference because I can't say that just because someone has a different lifestyle than mine that, that they're wrong. And I have to say, you know, that's just what that person, you know, that's how they choose to live. And that doesn't affect how I'm living. So I don't tend to get involved in a lot of that stuff, but you, you do see it a lot in the industry. And you can start off with, um, the fact that everyone likes to, to date the same female. It's like, it's like, okay, um, how do you feel having sex with my girlfriend and then still being my friend? Or did we not, it's almost like we both just had sex with her without being, you know, it's just a whole bunch of nastiness that goes on. As far as him being with men, um, that's a rumor that I've heard and it's also, um, I, from with my own eyes, I never saw him uh, in the act of being with a man, but I saw some questionable men in a room, and I saw a lot of smiling and giggling and all of that kind of stuff as far as what they did after the drinks and all of that, or going out, I don't know nothing about it. I went into a few parties where I walked in and I saw some celebrities sitting on uh, Clive Davis lap type stuff, you know, but when I looked and I was like, wow, I see what's going on. Maybe this ain't the room that I'm supposed to be in. And then I would leave. Like it'd be clubs you go to and on the top floor of this club, it'd be celebrities, Russell Simmons, all of those high end celebrities, Maxwell, all of those people is up there. And when you go up there, that's like VIV and nobody really is getting up there unless you're an artist or someone or you're with someone. And when I got up there, I saw a lot of that, but I also knew that I can go back downstairs and I'll just wait on y'all downstairs. This is not the room for me. I guess there was a situation where he had Kim Porter's phone tapped. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? All right. So I'm in the studio and uh, up at daddy house and uh, they sitting there and they like, yo, um, Shakir Stewart had called Kim Porter's phone and he was like, how's my kids? How's my baby? Something like that. And I think that's exactly what it was. And he took offense to it because it was another man calling his, his wife asking how are his kids, like they're his kids were his kids. And it had been rumored that Shakir had 
relationships with a lot of people's women, a lot of people date. Because in the industry, you remember, everybody was sleeping with everybody. It wasn't something that wasn't known. This girl used to be with him and then she was with him. All of this stuff is going on in the industry. So, so yeah, he was in there and uh, he was hearing Shakira Stewart's conversation with her. And I was like, how in the world is he listening to her phone? Like, how in the world? Then that's when I found out that he had her phone plugged up. And I don't know if he had some surveillance things in her house, but he knew everything this girl was doing. You know, every person she was talking to. It's, it's insecurities. You know, insecurities. He was just insecure. Insecure people do those kind of things. And I guess there was a situation with L.A. Reid? With L.A. Reid, well, when he saw Shakira Stewart at L.A. Reid's wedding, that's when him and Shakira got into a confrontation. And, you know, uh, Shakira Stewart used to work right up under L.A. Reid at Hitco. You have to just do the history of it. Hitco was a production, a music production company. They had people like um, a lot of producers signed. They had um, uh, Beyonce was signed. Like they had writers and they had uh, producers. So in order to do a song like, let's say, with Beyonce, you would have to be a part of that Hitco that they gave a deal to that says, if you do the first single on Beyonce, this is gonna give us the opportunity to recoup the money that we gave you in an advance. So they'll give you 500,000 in advance, then give you a Beyonce single, and then now you're making the money back that they gave you, but you're, you're gonna do it because they're gonna allow you to do a Beyonce single. Shakira Stewart, worked over Hitco. So a lot of producers, he was able to help feed and put a, he put a lot of producers on. He put a lot of artists on during his time with being with Def Jam. Really great guy. And, um, you know, really great guy. And um, that was L.A. Reid's right hand man when it came to that business. And that was the person that Puff had a problem with, you know, because of whatever the allegations of him um, sleeping with um, his his child's mother, which I think naturally everybody would, would would get upset if they found out that someone was having an affair or even thinking of having an affair with someone that you're involved with. You know, I think I wouldn't like it if somebody was trying to have an affair with my girl, but then at the same time, I would think about it and say, am I being everything that she needs in order to keep her contained like, is it me that she really likes or does she just like the way that I, I, the things that I buy for her? So his relationships based more off of material things and monetary things. My relationship was based more off of love. I don't think he's ever been in a relationship that was based off of love. And I guess that's why he called himself love because love is something that he's definitely missing. So what happened with the situation where he ran into... Uh... Ran into him and hit him with the chair. Just what you just said. He walked in, they had their little words, he hit him with the chair. Hit him with the chair. And then, you know, but that's not nothing. It's hit him with a chair. He could have hit him with his fist. He could have hit him with anything else. He almost like threw a chair at him, which is almost like a, 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 a form of throwing a tantrum. You know, like little kids. Let me throw this chair at you. Like, how how you going to, you know, hit somebody with a chair, I can move out the way. But yeah, he hit him with the chair. You knew their relationship wasn't one that was great. Because of course, if you're, if you're sleeping or trying to sleep with my, my child's mother, then we're gonna have a problem. If you're sneaking around my back, doing it behind my back, and, and I'm just finding out about it through other people or even my female is telling me, hey, you know, whatever you're not getting, giving me, I'm getting it from over here from this person. That really makes you mad, especially when a female rubs it in on you. We don't know if she was rubbing it in like, hey, I'm sleeping with somebody else, whatever it may be, but whatever it was, he didn't like it. Well, Cat Williams uh, just went viral. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it or seen some of it. 
You know, uh, you know, he's been going crazy on the internet, man. Millions and millions of views in just like a day. You know, uh, one thing he said about Puff was, Diddy wants to party. And he had to tell him no. You know, a lot of people have talked about these Diddy parties and, you know, what could or couldn't be going on at these Diddy parties, man. You know, being around Puff, what happens if you've seen these Diddy parties, as, have you seen anything at these Diddy parties? Or, you know what I'm saying, if you haven't seen anything, you know, what have you heard or what do you think goes on? It's, it's a lot of sex, a lot of drugs, and a lot of music. Remember, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. With hip hop, it's still the same thing, sex, drugs, and hip hop. So in these parties, you see a lot of people. You see, you just got to imagine a female who's just looking for that big break that all, that all of a sudden gets invited to a Puff Daddy party and she feels like this is my opportunity to go in there and make the most friends I can possibly make. She's going to go in there and be free with everyone. So then it's, it's just one of those kind of parties. I would go in to look for her and get up out of there. I wouldn't want to stay and be a part of the party like when after everybody's been uh, is, is alleviated and and out of their mind and then now we're going to go back to so-and-so's house or Puff Daddy's house and we're going to continue the party there. You know how they say, we're going to take it back to here and continue the party here, right? That's when you got to leave because you'd be like, no, once, once you get there first, they might not let you in. They'd be like, oh, it's a private party because they know, hey, what's going to go in here is going to stay in here. And then especially if you're not if you're not part of it, like you don't need to be there if you're not part of it. You know, if I'm not joining in the festivities, I'm not going to jump in the pool naked with a whole bunch of other guys and all of this stuff. Everybody naked in the pool type stuff. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting naked around other guys like that, period, man. Except only time I do that is in, if we if we in jail and we got to take a shower or something like that. That's the only time I could see having a, for a man to have to get naked around another man. So you just leave. It's not for you. It's not for me. Well, I think you had mentioned several times Puffy would answer the door butt naked. Butt naked, man. Look like a a, a, a a baby just sitting there. You'd be like, damn, bro. Like, have a little respect, man. You know, I'm knocking on your door. You looked out the peephole. You saw it was me. Why are you going to open the door and be like, come on in? I'd be like, nah, that's not the invitation I'm looking for. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not looking for that. That was like the test. I'm telling you, it was a test to see if you're going to say something. You know how sometimes you have somebody else sit there and talk about your best friend. Hey, man. Hey, man, so-and-so ain't this and this, this, this. And you sit there and listen to him, and that's your best. You be like, man, why is you sitting there talking to me about somebody I care about, right? So why is you, you know, you opening up a door with no clothes on like it's cool? Like, what are you trying to see if I'm not going, if I'm not, if I'm going to be like, not notice that you're naked? You'd be like, bro, you're, you're naked. Did you notice that you're naked? Like, I don't, I'll come back later, right? But if they say, come on in, and then you go in, and you be sitting there, and he butt naked, and you don't be, and you acting like you don't see naked. You be, people be so much, so caught up in the stars, and, and so fascinated just by being there with him. They never even realized that he's sitting there talking to him naked. That's just crazy. How, yeah, I'd be like, man, bro, you're naked, man. We ain't got nothing to talk about till you put some clothes on. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's real shit, real shit. Man. Yeah. Okay, so you know, one of the things Diddy is accused, man, he he's accused of him and Aaron Hall of raping somebody. Do you actually think Diddy is actually uh, capable of actually raping somebody? If you listen to what Aaron Hall said, Aaron Hall said that he had to show them who was the king. And he said he was putting on trying to show them that he was the master at it. They, if not, if I ain't mistaken, he was like, he had the big joint or something like that. As far as comparing penis size, he was kind of like saying that of all of them, he had the bigger penis and he was letting them know. I don't know. But again, any any two men together comparing penises is a problem. 
You know, when we sit in here talking, like somebody can ask me, like, yo, is your joint big? I'd be like, I really don't know because I never really compared it to nobody else's. Like, I never looked at nobody like, yo, is your joint big? Yo, my joint, your joint bigger than mine. You know what I'm saying? That's just not something men do. See, we don't feel comfortable. Men don't feel as comfortable being like that around other men. And anytime you see a man that feels comfortable like that around other men, you have to question that person's whatever you want to call that. I ain't gonna say sexuality, but whatever it is they're attracted to, some 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 men gonna find themselves attracted to men. And in this case, that might be what we're talking about. Some men might be attracted to women, but still, in this case, that's not what we're talking about. It just depends on what they wanted. <laughs> you know, I keep everything. I always put morals first. I say morals come first, you know what I'm saying? So before I do anything, I think about it first. And I say, am I doing the right thing? I ain't doing the right thing. I'm not doing it. It's over. Could you tell if other people were engaging in these activities with Puffy? Or, you know, did he have, like, special friends or guys that he might have treated different? Or, or if we were on the road and then I knock on the door, the same door that I knock on, and, and he used to answer and don't have no clothes on, or are you saying that I ever knock on the door and I open up the room and it just be niggas in there sweating? You'd be like, wow, I seem like a lot of activities going on in here. What y'all guys working out? You start looking for the weight, start looking for the pull-up bars and stuff. What y'all doing pull-up? What y'all doing squats, dips? What's going on? And why is everybody, why is everybody breathing hard and sweating, right? Then you'd be like, well, I'm ready to go downstairs to the lobby and get me something to eat. You'd be like, I'm out of here too, man, because I ain't working out. I ain't going to be around a whole bunch of dudes with no shirts on sweating because there's no, there's no way to explain why two men is in the room sweating and huffing and puffing. Like we just finished doing Man. work. Like some, they could be working out. We don't know. But I do know, you know, it's too much going on in this room. Mm. How often would something like that happen? Uh, let's say we go on tour, probably every time we went on tour and I had like, let's say on the tour, if we there for two days out of, out of, out of 20 trips, no, no, let's say out of 10 trips to Puff Room to just go and be like, let me go see what they doing today. Let me go see what, what they got up. What time we going to the show? How we doing it? Like, what time the bus leaving tomorrow, man? Look, I don't want to, why, why every time, why is it only two hours to get to the next state and we leaving at six in the morning and the show is tomorrow at eight? It's like, why you purposely want us to get out the hotel and leave early in the morning? Because they'll be like, yeah, the locks and the mace and all of them boys is over there at this hotel having fun. They over there tearing it down. And then they be like, all right, bet, I'll fix that. Let's make sure that they tour bus leave tomorrow at seven in the morning. Now, can you imagine waking up at seven in the morning and having to leave to go two hours away because they, nobody wants you to have fun in the hotel? So wait, so so you're saying Diddy was hating on him having fun? He hate on anything that's fun. Anything that anything that he can't do that he see people doing, got to stop it. So that means you can go to the mall and come into the studio with a nice pair of sneakers on. He gonna look at your sneakers and be like, he don't like them because he can't go to the mall and get some sneakers himself because every time he go to the mall, he gonna tell you this story. Where you get the sneakers from? I said, I got them from the mall. He was like, I can't go to the mall. I say, well, he said, every time I go to the mall, they have to come and shut the store down and come get me out because people start crowding me. I was like, well, well, well. He was like, well, next time you go to the mall, can you pick me up a pair of sneakers? I was like, sure. Why not? Because you can't go to the mall. He couldn't even eat McDonald's. I could eat McDonald's. I could go to Walmart. I could do all of the things that he can't do, which in return makes me feel rich. You know what I'm saying? So rich, sometimes people are spiritually bankrupt and sometimes people are financially bankrupt. He's spiritually bankrupt. He could be rich, but he's spiritually bankrupt. I could be broke, but I'm spiritually rich. Either way you think about it, depends on how we spending it and how we feel about it. We touched about 
uh, you know, Puffy's jealousy a little bit, man. But one of the things he was accused of doing was blowing up Kid Cudi's car for having somewhat of a relationship with Cassie. You know, what do you think about that? Is that is that not too extreme for Puff or? It's not too extreme, but we got a question. Did Kid Cudi's car have a carburetor? Um, it just depends on so many different things. Like what, what year was the car? Um, was it fuel injected? Like could it have been anything else? So to say he blew up a car, you like, wow. And then wasn't nobody blowing up in the car. What was he warming it up? Um, how did the car blow up? It just all of a sudden this went into flames. So it's a good question, but it's something that you, that makes you say like, damn, like if he would have blown up his car, what is he like? 007 MacGyver or something? Like he would have blew up a few people's cars. I would I would be afraid to get in my car if I found out this was true. I'd be like, I'm not riding. You remember the um, Kenny Green, the movie Kenny Green, How to Kill the Irishman? Uh. No, I don't think I've seen it. Man, mean Kenny Green. They blew Kenny Green car up. Now, if he blew, if they blew Kitty car, uh, Kid Cuddy car up like they blew up uh, Kenny Green car, oh, that's terrible. But I don't really think that. Uh, I think uh, Kid Cuddy may have a, a, a few um, engine difficulties or something. Like, they never said what kind of car it was either. Like, if it was a brand new Maserati. Was it a Lamborghini or was it a 1982 uh, Sentra? Uh, what was it? Was it a Maxima? What kind of car was it? Well, I, I think the story goes, Cassie, Diddy, Cassie says that Diddy told her, I'm going to blow up Kid Cudi's car. And then not too long after that, the car was the car blew up. So I, I don't know. I don't think Cassie ever says that she that he told her he blew up the car. It was just one of those kind of, you know what I'm saying, kind of like, I'm going to do this, and then it happened. But I don't know if she ever got confirmation that he actually did it. Well, if he said to her that he going to blow up the man's car, and then the man's car all of a sudden went into flames, I would kind of think that what he said was true. I'd be like, well, he told me he was going to blow it up, and it blew up. He didn't tell me he was going to blow it up. So if he ain't tell me that, the only thing I'm going to think is I didn't know the car. I think Kid Cuddy, uh, Cuddy might have had a couple of car issues. Yeah, I don't, this depends on who his mechanic was. And then where was his car parked at? Did they have to jump a gate? Was it parked outside the apartment complex? You know what I'm saying? Because some people do this kind of stuff. They get money, have a nice expensive car, big Bentley or something, and then they go in to visit a girl who lives in the apartment complex. You'd be like, well, it was a perfect opportunity for them to do something to your car because you shouldn't have had this car over here. You know? So we have to just look into that right there. Let's look into that. Because I, I really want to know if he blew up that man's car. Because if he did that, I'm going to start doing Uber more. If my car ever catch on fire, you know what happened. I'm just letting y'all know. So at least we know we're going to rule out uh, my car catching on fire. That one already been done. We got to do it something more original. Do you think Diddy's actually capable of coming after some of the guys and people who are speaking out against him? I think Diddy's capable of coming out, uh, 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 going against anybody who speaks against him. And then, and if you really ask me, I think he's winning at it. I think that everybody who he wants to get at, he's getting at. You know, it's, it's happening right now as we as we see it. Like we looking at, look at how many people have dealt with him that you see not no longer here today. Look at look at Heavy D, no longer here. Um, look at um, Andre Harrell, no longer here. Kim Porter, no longer here. Biggie Smalls, no longer here. I know Black Rob ain't, but Black Rob, no longer here. Francesca Spiro, no longer here. It's just everybody who played a part in, in his success that had a part. No, a lot of them are not here no more. Wolf, Anthony Jones, no longer here. The security. It's so many people that are no longer here that... Man, it's it's incredible. I never seen someone lost. Uh, I believe they said, uh, what's that? Three hundred. The label that uh, Young Thug or whatever the, the all of the people signed to in Atlanta. They they say a lot of artists from that label have lost their lives. But 
in comparison to how many people that came around Puff that lost their lives, I think there's more people around Puff that lost their lives than the people who were signed to that label with the Migos in them. The Migos, that label. Um, there was a lot of lives lost on that label. But I think Bad Boy got took the record. Bad Boy's still running champion. They the champs. And champs are losing artists. They undefeated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, man. It's it's uh, there, there's been some really wild situations, man. Even G. Depp, who went to jail, he's getting out, I believe, here pretty soon. I talked to G. Depp. You know, I talked to G. Depp. I talked to his mom. Like to yesterday, I talked to his mom. I was I was going to talk to G. Depp today at ten thirty. So yeah, I, I still talk to to. De I'm in communication because I'm waiting on him to come home. In fact, when G. Depp comes home, guess what he wants to do. What's that? Move to Atlanta. Oh, okay, dope. When Rob was in New York, guess what all he ever wanted to do? Why, why does everybody want to move to Atlanta? Because I'm here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm here, and I'm such like a big brother and so, so good to my friends, man. Sometimes people just, they be like, Mark, I want to be out there where you at, man. I want, I want to be with you. Because you know, look, I'm able to do things as a regular person still. I'm able to go rehab a house. I could still, for real, for real, I could go to Walmart. I could go to Target. People can't do that kind of stuff. I can ride down the street in a truck that's a work truck and not be embarrassed. Some people mm. can't do that. So I feel like I have a good life because I'm able to do that. Yeah, there's a price to pay for fame, that's for sure. It's, it's, it's you know? Yeah, so it's a lot of, to be famous, man, is dangerous. I think that's the reason why famous and dangerous sounds the same. It's real dangerous nowadays to be famous. It's not the same. Fame, these past few years have been really horrible for famous people, man. Maybe the past five, six years, seven years or something. It's been bad for famous people. If you're famous, you really got a big target on you. It's oh, yeah. And then, you know, uh, that that's why we look at the things and we say, like, when, when people the idol tree and we say, you know, a lot of I don't want to be an idol because so many people fall. You see idols fall. You be like, I don't want to be an idol because I don't want to fall. So only thing you see, all of these famous people is just they, they're losing their lives, man. People are dying to be famous. Right. Right. You no. Know? Well, what, one more question before we get off of uh, uh, the whole Diddy situation. A lot of people are wondering about Usher, about Usher living with him when he was a kid. Did you ever see him and Usher around each other? Yes. That's when. How, how was that? That's when uh, Usher was on Arista, and Arista was LaFace. Well, they were, he was on LaFace. And then Diddy did that song, that one song that he did for him, that one single. That was, I believe, before the Bad Boy era. Diddy did that song with Usher. And then if Usher slept, but Diddy slept on Andre Harrell couch. And Diddy also slept on um, Dallas Austin couch when he came down here to Atlanta before he got Dallas Austin. And Kim Porter was the one that helped him get with L.A. Reid to fund bad boy so when he came down here from new york he often would be around dallas so um he slept on couches if usher slept on his couch i hope usher didn't sleep on his couch and get the same treatment that diddy may have gotten when he slept on other people's couches because you know how that casting couch is when somebody asks you to sleep on their couch what they're trying to do is demasculate you like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make you, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to uh, sun you out. Basically, I wanna, I, if you sleep on, if if you sleep on my couch, because if I had to sleep on somebody's couch and I was Usher, I'd be like, wait, why do I need to sleep on your couch? And I got, I'm Usher. I got I can just go to the club and just go throw my hands in the air. A hundred ladies gonna want to take me home. So as soon as I so, got to the point where I had to sleep on somebody's couch, I'd be like, no, take me to the club and drop me off. I'll figure it out. I'll go in the club, get on the mic, be like, bad boy for life. I'll get him a free song. 
buy a couple of girls a couple of drinks or something like that. I'm going home with one of them. I ain't sleeping on nobody's couch. So I, I believe that it was when they were, when Yasha was young, before he was famous, I, he stayed with Diddy. I don't I don't know about I don't know about sleeping Ooh. on the couch. Yeah, you you know it's a couple of things that uh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that 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 and I remember that story there and I remember a few a few other stories, but at the same time, Usher is a cool person to me. And no matter what Usher is, Usher has always been Usher. You know, I never, I never expected. He dated Tamika Foster, and they went through their relationship. Tamika's cool, but Usher is Usher. And you never know what to expect from people. So he has, you know, his Usher type of way. And I, I, I don't never really judge, you know, how, how his ways or how he acts, but we do know the stories. It's been some stories. It's been some. Oh. It's been some stories, but some stories that, if it's true for those who know the stories, then they know it. For those who may not understand or know that truth, ooh, maybe that's just something that is just not meant to be known. You know, it would be very incriminating for these kind of stories to be talked about. I remember when Shine came home from from jail. They released Shine, right? And then they deported him to Belize, said he couldn't come back to the United States. So he goes back to Belize. And do you remember when Def Jam signed him to a record deal? They gave him what, $8 million? million? Dollars. How much? A mil- L.A. Reid gave him a million dollars. All right, so L.A. Reid gave him a million dollars to put out an album, and the album never came out. I knew that when L.A. Reid went to give him that million dollars, that that was Puff giving him the money, but he had to give it through L.A. Reid. They never so intended. That- they never intended on giving him an album. If they would have gave him a million dollars for an album, wouldn't we have heard an album? Okay, so what you're saying is this is Puffy's way of paying Shine off for taking the rap for him. You're very smart. Yeah. But then that's typical, you know. You always have other people paying other people for things that people need them to pay for. That was just one. That was one. Yeah, uh, Shine came home. He was horrible. Horrible. I mean, his voice didn't sound the same. His lyrics wasn't the same. It, it was like everybody was so hyped for Shine to come home, and we had been talking about Shine coming. Oh, when Shine gets home, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because he just did this bid. It was like he was this, you know what I'm saying? You know, real gangster dude. Now he's gonna come home, and he's just gonna kill shit. And he came home. Voice wasn't the same. Lyrics wasn't the same. And they gave him this million dollars, and everybody was like, "Why the f- would you give?" Him a million dollars. And no everybody was like, L.A. Reid got to be going crazy right now. He got to be stressing. Yeah. So that's when I realized, man, they must not be giving him the money for this album. That was just a way to get him some money, you know, for, for what he had to do. And they deported him. Damn. So you be like, damn, you got deported and you ain't got no money? Mm-mm. So, from your point of view, what do you think happened that night? That night at the club? Yep. Uh, was a dude threw some money at Puff, kind of insulted him. Shine being the person who who hangs around Puff that feels like, you know, um, out of respect to my brother. Or sometimes you could think Puff is like a brother. You can. It's easy to mistake Puff as a friend. For real. Until you need him. Then when you need him, you're going to realize he's not, the, he's not the same person that you thought he was, right? So you could be in the club with him and somebody could be like, yo, F Puff. And you'd be like, what? This nigga said what? Then you pull out the gun and want to start shooting or whatever it may be as what Shine did. And the next thing you know, you're in trouble. Re- reverse it. If it was somebody saying F Mark in the club and I was with Puff, would Puff say what? And then pull out his gun and start shooting? 
know, right? Right. So that's that just lets you know right then if you did that for him, it was either you was you was just thinking something where you wasn't in your right frame of mind. You must have thought that this dude was your friend or somebody that cares about you. He don't care about you. He's not your friend. He going he going to say and I believe in his interview, he said that they was asking him was shine like a brother or uh, someone that uh, was like someone he cared. He was like, he was just an artist. He was just another artist on my label. That's what Puffy said about Shine? Yeah, and that had to hurt. You know, especially if I was mm -hmm. Shine. I'm like, yo, I'm in prison and that because I'm trying to protect you and you telling them that I'm nothing but just an artist? Well, when I shot this gun, I didn't shoot this gun as an artist. I shot this gun as someone who felt like I was a brother of yours, see, and that's something that he's he's capable of doing. He he's capable of making you feel like he's your friend. He's capable, like I told you. I want you to understand this deep. You go into his office. You say, Puff, I'm here to talk to you about the money for my recording deal. Where's the money? He say, Oh, the money's there. But I just need you to make one more song so we can start promoting and marketing. And you be like, okay, well, only thing I need is one more song. Only thing you need, Playboy, is one more song. And then you walk out that room and in your mind you think, I need to go to the studio right now and create one more song. And then as you walk in, it hits you and you be like, wait a minute, he just sent me for a golden chicken. He just sent me out trying to um, look for the impossible. So then you go back, you be like, man, hold up, man. I don't, I don't really believe in that one more song thing. I don't really believe in that. Let's, let's think of something else. Another way we can do business. That one more song thing, man. I keep chasing that one more song. I've been chasing that one more song for so long. That song don't exist. So that's what it's like doing business with somebody. It's like the master of evasion. Somebody who's, who's, who can evade any question you ask them. Quick and send you back out and you thinking that he just told you the answer. He ain't told you nothing. He just spent you up out of here. So is there anything anything else from the Shine situation you want to add? Other than the fact that, you know, me and Shine lived in Puff's house together. We we lived together. He was like my roommate at one point in time. And um I remember when he first got signed. It's all in the book when he first got signed and um one of the first things he wanted when he got signed was a Mercedes Benz. So we go to the Mercedes Benz dealership and then he wanted a 600 and they was out of 600s. So he told them to give them the 500, take the numbers off and put the 600 on there. So it could look like he got the 600 and that's what he did. First day he come home, the window got shot out cause he, he, he had some girl house. And the boyfriend come home and he over there with his car, whatever. And um, the boyfriend shoots the car, shoot the window out. And then the next day he came home, the mirror was broke. And I realized he couldn't drive. And then the next day I got a call and said for me to come down to the hospital and they meet, need me to identify some people. And I go to the emergency room in New York and I get there and the whole emergency room is full of Shine, his cousins, his friends, and everything. And Shine is over in this room. The doctor told me not to tell Shine that his cousin died. In the, in the car accident, the axle of the Mercedes Benz had came out. His cousin was in the back seat, and the axle came out in, uh, of the back seat on the impact and went straight through his cousin's chest, killed him. So. When I walk in, he was like, how's everything? How's my cousin? How's everybody? I was like, I had to tell him everybody was cool. Everything is just fine. And then he didn't actually know that his cousin had died in that car accident. And um, I was there for him through that because he lived with me in the house. So the police knew to come to the house. And they was like, do I know Sean? And I told him, yes. They said, we need you to come to the hospital. I know him deep like that, deep enough to where you know, it was a time I think Sean was, he had a gun in the house and the bullet was jammed in the gun. And he was just so infatuated with guns and Hetzels and, and Glocks and every rap that he was singing was like, when I gripped the Glock and when I, you'd be like, damn, you got, you got a lot of raps about guns. Like your raps are kind of violent. And you know what I'm saying? But that's what 
he felt he wanted to come out with Bad Boy. So he went around, he had the, the gun, the bullet jam, and I tell him, he's like, can you get the, can you unjam the gun? I say, I grab the gun and unjam it, and I say, Shine, if you don't know how to unjam this gun, you probably don't need to be having it, right? And I knew his grandmother that used to come by the house and check up on him all the time. I used to have to tell her that, you know what, as long as he around me, I'm going to make sure I'm taking care of him. I'm going to make sure he's doing the right things. And, and that was the kind of relationship me and Shine had. Today, it's not like that. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't hear anything from him. Um, not that I'm expecting to, you know, but it would be nice for, for him to say, what up, Curry? I ain't got no problem with you. Don't be mad at me just because I, I me and Puff got an issue. Like, damn, people got mad at me. They was like, damn, Curry, I, I can't be your friend because I'm Puff friend still. You be like, damn, don't get mad at me. And don't want to be my friend just because you his friend? Okay, nothing wrong with that. Well, there was a situation where the cops came knocking on your door and some women were accusing Puffy of raping them or something? You yeah. Know, what, what all happened with that situation? That story right there, man, is one that I think, I, I think it kind of shows more of what happens when you're famous and, and like the females, they came over with, they came over with, with Zip and somebody else they were with. They came over with Zip and somebody else. And they knocked on the door and I let them in. And then I went back upstairs because I'm like, I'm not, that's day party. I ain't got nothing to do with it. That's day girls. I ain't going to be sitting here, you know. So I went back upstairs. It was Puff House. It was Puff Apartment. And um, it was like a townhouse, three floors. So I was sleeping on the third floor. Sean was on the bedroom on the third floor. Then it was a middle floor. It was two floors. One, two, it was two floors. So I'm downstairs. Well, no, they downstairs. So then they leave. So when they leave, it's probably about three in the morning, four in the morning, they leave. So then I hear another knock on the door. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, yeah, who is it? They was like, it's the police. I said, I opened the door, I said, what's going on? And it was like, yeah, it was two females that are outside saying that they were in here and Puff Daddy raped them. And I said, Puff ain't been here. Like, he ain't been here and I ain't seen him. I ain't seen him nowhere around here. So um, the next morning, it was even in the newspaper. It was in the newspaper. Puff Daddy, two girls accused him of rape. So, but what I learned from then was I was there and Puffy wasn't there, and I knew it. But for them to say that the allegations that he was there, that's what kind of makes me look at a lot of these cases that's going on now, where people are saying, oh, he did this to me, or he did this to me. And when you look at it, like me personally, I'm looking at it, I'm like, you don't see these same allegations coming across, uh, about um, basketball players or football players. It seems like they're targeting just entertainers. So I think there's a big attack on the culture, that they're attacking the culture. So starting off attacking how they're going about doing this, they're attacking a lot of the pioneers, the ones that are the leaders of the culture. And when I saw that case, and I knew that, and then I, I started seeing more people come out saying he did this to them, it kind of like put me in the same um it kind of made me think just like the girls that was at the door saying that he did it and he wasn't there. So you have a lot of that. It just comes with being famous. You can even kiss a girl and she's going to say you raped her. A girl can have sex with you willingly and then turn around and say you raped her. They do this all the time. Sometimes they get emotional. They start, they be like, I don't know why I did this. Or they start feeling embarrassed. That's not like me. I don't know why I did this. I was drunk. I was drinking. And they blaming everything they did off of being drunk or whatever it was or whatever they was on. And then you be like, yo, you know what? You knew what you was doing when it was going on. When we walked up in here, you took your clothes off. I didn't, I didn't take them off of you. You took them off and you told me that when I came into the room to let you know and wake you up. And that's just what I did, right? 
they'll turn around and say you raped them. Especially once they, once they do something like that and they feel like, damn, I can't believe I just gave him my all. And I gave him my all with expecting that he would like me and feel like I'm wifey material and maybe want to have a relationship with me. And after they done gave him his all, they gave him their all and then they're not winning. So that kind of makes, that hurts females, especially after they done slept with you and they not winning. So you have a lot of them. So you have to be careful about how you sleeping with these females, man. That's why I was all, I kept my stuff in my pants. For real, I ain't going around. I'm keeping mine in my pants. That was my gift. I was like, once you get to see that baby, you seen God. I was like, you ain't going to see God tonight. I'm taking him to the crib. <laughs> You know, you really told a wild story, man. I also read about it in your book mm -hmm. about the night that Big Jake was killed. Yeah. Can you kind of take me through it? All right. Now, we got this club. Now, we got this club. Some associates of mine have a club. They had a club. And so I worked the front door at the club all the time. I didn't work like it was my job. I worked because this is where I just like to be. I, I, I had the responsibility of making, checking IDs, because it was a lot of, you know, Atlanta was a college town. So around this time, a lot of the college kids that were underage wanted to come into the club. So I would check the IDs and everything at the front of the door, that's my job. So I'm at the job working one day and we got this function going on for Jermaine Dupree. It's his birthday, September 23rd, 1995. And um, so I'm at the door. I see a limb. I see everybody in the club. Uh, Puff in the club. Wolf and them is in the club. Jermaine Dupree is in the club. Dallas Austin is in the club. Man, G is in the club. All the rim shop is in the club. So we there, and then so I saw when Shug pulled up, they pulled up in the limo, and then Jake got out and walked into the club. I let him in. Then he came back out, and then when he came back out, him and Shug came into the club together. So when I saw them coming into the club, then I let them in, they walked in. So I'm still in the front of the club. So. I walk inside the club after, you know, things are slowing up outside, I walked in the club and then I saw Jake on the, uh, on the, right by the bar on the dance floor right there. And he was arguing with my friend's wife and he was arguing and I'm, she's from California and she knew Jake and Suge from California because she came from uh, the same kind of neighborhood as them in California, as in Compton. So he came in there and Jake was like, this is Bob and Pyro. He, he's talking to H Puff Security, Wolf. Wolf is talking to my friend's wife because at the club we had Bad Boy Fridays. So every Friday we, we would have a Bad Boy party and the promoter was Wolf. So he was promoting these parties at the club. So Jake was saying to her, oh, um, you throwing all of these East Coast parties, all these, all these bad boy parties, like you, you sucking these East Coast niggas. Mm. That was disrespectful. And when he said that, that was like a form of diss to my friend. Um, so earlier that day when he came in and he went and did his rounds and that's when G saw my friend G saw everything that he saw which is the the slap where he say Jermaine Dupree but I wasn't there to see that witness myself and even if I did see that I wouldn't have liked the fact that he put his hands on Jermaine because Jermaine is like one of the hometown favorites here so it's not any form of disrespect when that story is there. It's a form of high respect because I didn't like it. And then so he had his, his words with Puff. And um, so we downstairs and they come out this little room that they had upstairs. They went in and, and, and they were talking in this, just like a room that we used to have upstairs that they used to gamble in. And um, they went in there 
and they came outside of this room and everything seemed like everything was all peace. And so they walked downstairs and my, my guy is, is, is kind of like telling them, you know, we got to get out, they, you know, they got to leave the club. And when they were leaving the club, when they were arguing, I saw a guy that I knew, he was from New York, and he was, he was at the bar. He finished his drink like this, and I already knew him. I knew him like very well. Cause every night when the club would close, he would come and knock on the door to buy like three bottles of Cristal. And this time Cristal was like $195, $200 a bottle. So I would purposely stay at the club late night so when he knocked, I could make that extra couple of hundred dollars off of selling him some bottles. So when he, he, he left, and when he left, and Jake was coming out the club, and Suge was coming out the club, Puff was right there with Suge, and they were walking out, and then all of a sudden, you seen the guy who left from the bar from New York, he left, and then you seen him standing there, and he was shooting Jake. And I was standing right next to Jake, but being that I knew who the, who the shooter was, I knew he wasn't going to miss. And he was just close enough to do it, handle what he was doing. So I sat there and I looked and I was watching and I saw him do it and I saw him leave. But what you, you said something about in the book you talked about, he was like looking at Suge like your neck. Yeah, he was looking. No, nah, he was looking when he was shooting Jake. He was looking at Suge to say this should have been you. But he couldn't shoot Suge because Suge had grabbed Puff and he had Puff. In, a, in like a chokehold in front of him. So as the guy was shooting, he couldn't shoot Puff. I mean, Suge, because he would have shot Puff. So he was using, uh, Suge grabbed Puff and was using him as a human shield. Yes. And which you, you know, um, there's so many different cases where, where you know about Suge using people as human shield. He used females as human shields. <laughs> That's just how Suge was. Anything pop off, he gonna grab anybody else around him and put him in front of him. If he in a car, if y'all shoot the car, y'all gonna shoot these girls first. That's just Suge using a human shield. So that night, he happened to grab Puff as a human shield. And um, so... Um, well, what happens? Does he drag, he drags Puffy back into the club? They, what is Puffy saying? He went saying? back into the club. He went back in the club and he kept saying, damn, damn, damn. And then Puff was like, it's going to be all right. And he was like, what you mean it's going to be all right? He said, I know it's going to be all right. You tell your mama it's going to be all right. You tell your kids it's going to be all right. And then it was an argument. And then he was like, Puff, Suge, I ain't got nothing to do with that. Suge, I ain't got nothing to do with that. And true indeed, Puffy didn't have nothing to do with that. Um, Jake had came in there tripping and... It was a lot of things that was going on between Jake and the people that he may have known, that he may have known them before they were in Atlanta, however it go. But um, after he escorted them out, then we were outside, and then Suge was like, um, he was yelling at Puff. And then um, at the end, Jake was dying, and so... It was some guys that walked by and was like, you know, they was like, damn. And they looked at everybody. They was like, they saw Jermaine Dupree. They saw, they saw everybody. You know, Dallas. I don't know if Jermaine was still there, but they saw Dallas, Puff, and Suge. And they looked and they was like, every time I see y'all, I see death. The only thing I see is people around y'all dying all the time. And he said, y'all sitting here going back and forth talking about it. it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. What about this man right here on the ground that's dying? When are y'all gonna get together and at least say a prayer for this man, he's dying? So then we grabbed hands and then we got into a prayer circle. And then uh, a few days after that, Jake died in the hospital. That's how the story of Jake. But that was before I was an artist on Bad Boy. That that incident happened when I, I wasn't even signed to Bad I, Puff didn't, even I don't even think he remembered that that was me. Okay, now in your book you mentioned Big Meech coming to the rim shop. Yeah, Big Meech. And then you mentioned 
that there's this untold story about Big Meech that you didn't talk about in the book. Can you share that story with me? Which one? Which untold story? I don't know. That's just what it says in the book. You Is said it? there's you said something about there's a story about Big Meech, but you're gonna save that for another day. Right. The only the, on Big Meech, I don't know. The only thing on that that I think that would be, you know, that was a great thing was I knew Meech as well. I knew Wolf and I knew Meech. And I used to go to Meech house and Meech used to have a whole bunch of dogs and he would just have dogs around him. And then he would monitor and judge life based off of his relationship with his dogs. So that was a great thing, but I would, I would know him. But after, um, after Wolf had got killed and I was in the restaurant one time, I was in a restaurant when Wolf, um, when Meech first came home from jail, the first place he went to eat was at Puff Daddy restaurant, Justin's. So I'm sitting there like, why is he just getting out of jail and the first place he wanted to eat is Justin's? So they came to Justin's, had all these Ferraris and Porsches and everything parked outside. I'm inside eating and something was saying, do I leave because they here? Or are they gonna make me uncomfortable or do I just stay here and continue to eat my food? Because Wolf was very close to me, right? So I just stayed there and I was eating my food. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, one of them came and said, yo, Mark, um, Meech wants you to come to the back. He wanna holler at you. So I said, okay, I got up, I went to the back. And he was like, Mark, I really don't apologize to people you know, but I feel like I owe you an apology and I, I feel like you're, you're in the middle of something and, and you're confused. And I was like, I'm right. I said, you're right. And he was like, Mark, um, I didn't shoot at him first. He shot at me first. And he said that I, I was like, yo, so he shot at you first. So usually the first person who shoots the gun, we say, OK, you could have done anything else other than shoot the gun. So maybe th you shooting the gun is the reason why this may have happened. So it made me have to look at it a little different and understand his story as well as Wolf's story. Um, that was just my story, my story of Meech, but he used to come into the rim shop all the time before it was BMF. It was just Meech. BMF came later on. Okay. Did you ever have, have any stories or anything with them, seeing them around? I mean, regular stories. I just would never hang out. Like, he used to ask me um, to always hang out. Like, let's go out. Let's do it. And I, I never would hang out with them because every time they would go out, a, a lot of stuff would just be happening. You'd be like, man, people was getting hurt. And you'd be like, man, every time y'all out, man, somebody, something is happening. And I was like, I, I just didn't want to hang out. Like, I was like, nah, I'll just go home. I really stopped hanging out around that time. It was too much. Okay, and how did you fall out with Diddy? Fast. I fell out with him just over, not financial fallout, but just for, for false promises, misleading me, not, not caring about what, what I was trying to accomplish in life, just ignoring everything that I was working hard for. And I felt like my parents had blessed me with, you know, with this life in order to make something of it. And I felt like, he stood in the way from me accomplishing some things, but it didn't stop me because I was able to move around that mountain and still get across it. But, you know, it just made life hard and it made a lot of friends not be friends with me. Um, but, you know, suffering is not something, you know, through the suffer comes the gain, you know, and I, I, I look at things and I say, hey, you know, if they can, if Jesus could go through the things that he, that they put him through, and I'm not pouring religion into it, but if he can go through the things that they put him through, then I can go through some things too, and I can still come out on top the same way he did. Now, I guess a few years ago, Diddy started giving publishing back to their artists, but he made them sign an NDA to do it. What are your thoughts on that? First, how can you give me back something that never should have belonged to you? You're giving me back what's mine. And there's no way that you can have me sign an NDA because I, even if I do, I have prior business that's going on between him. In order for me 
for him to say I could never say anything about him, then he would have to kind of like give me a deal for my book. So that means I'm selling a book. If you want me to stop selling this book, then you're going to have to pay me for that. And that was something that he never wanted to do. And that's just another reason why the book is still selling now. You know, he had an opportunity one day to call me and say, Mark, let's let's rectify things. And I apologize for this. I would have been like he did that once. And he actually called and said, Mark, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm taking this love thing serious. And um, I thought he was kind of like apologizing. So I told him, look, if you're taking this serious, I'm going to take it serious. So he said he's taking it serious. He said he know what to do. I said, well, I'm taking it serious. I know what to do. I went home and immediately took the book down from sale because I knew, hey, he's going to call and be like, hey, I'm about to send you five million to something. I'm like, wow, OK. And it never happened. And I just sat there twiddling my thumbs like this. And then my girl told me, she said, boy, you stupid. Put that book back for sale. I put that joint back up for sale. My, when I stopped selling the book and I took it down, the book started selling for $100 a copy. So I had to put Damn. it back up. Yeah, I put it back up. But, if, you know, it was just a promise again. Where I'm like, yo, he's, he's, he's um, false promises again. Here we go again. It's like the third time he burnt me. I'm like, as long as you trying to do what you saying you doing and you being honest, then I'm going to be honest. So my word is only going to be as good as your word. If your word is good and solid with me, then I'm going to honor that. But if you're trying to word play me, I'm not honoring nothing you got going on. And you can't stop me from doing what I'm doing because I've been writing this book, been written in 2009. So as long as you want to talk to me about my book, that's different than talking about him. I'm talking about my book. So in order for me to not talk about my book, he didn't buy me out of not selling my book. And my book was already for sale before his NDA came into place. So, and again, I don't really, I don't really try to use like his, the demise of him for the, the upcome of myself. So I don't try to take advantage of what he's going through right now. You know, what he's going through right now is just unfortunate. And it's just something that's happening. But I separate that from my book. And I, I never try to put the two together. You know, my book has its own purpose, its own meaning, other than what he's going through. And I don't want to be known for his downfall. I want to be known for a great, being a great author or a friend or a great rapper like that. Not someone who talked about Puff Daddy. You know, he's not that important. He's not the, the biggest pawn on my table. I hear that. So, okay, so so you got your publishing back. Have you made any money off of your publishing? Yeah, as soon as I sold it. The first thing I well, you did... Sold, you already sold it. Man, publishing is only worth money when somebody buying it from you. It's like, well, I'm going to sit here and hold it for for what? So I So every year you get a check, you be like, man, every year you sitting back waiting on the check, waiting on the check. How don't, why don't y'all just give me seven, ten years worth of the money up front for however it's going to go? Give me the money up front. Let me invest in that and do something with that money than, other than sit here and wait on it. So, it, and the publishing really is nothing. It's only like, you know, if, if, you, if you ask yourself, where is music being sold? Music is being streamed, but it's not being sold. And they never gave us a deal for streaming our music. So now we're being so underpaid behind streaming and then publishing is not worth anything because no music is selling. But now we're stuck as artists, right? As an artist, because you're being underpaid for your music. Streaming doesn't have anything. I never did a streaming deal. I did a publishing deal, not a streaming deal. Well, man, uh, Mark Curry, man, you, you have a crazy story, man. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. And, uh, uh, sitting down with me. Man, I appreciate you having me on your platform and, and hopefully we can come back because I'm I'm sure there's so much more that we can talk about and so many other topics that we can touch up on. We just don't have enough time right now. But maybe as you read more of that book and I want to make sure everybody goes out and get a copy of this book, make sure you have a copy of this book. And then once you and if you can put a link to this in the bio so people when they click on that, they can go and see this and get this book. Follow me on Instagram. Subscribe to me on YouTube. And, um, you know, maybe as, the more you read the book and the more questions you come up with, I love to come back again and, and we can do another one. 
Okay. All right, man. Sounds good, man. Well, I once again, man, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your time. I appreciate sure. you. All right. Get ready for part right, two. Bro. Let's do a part two. All right. All right. For sure, man. All right. I'll be looking forward to it. Yes, sir. Me too. All right, bro. All right. I'll talk to you. Later. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.